making a very warm welcome to our visitors. Yeah. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Honourable Member for Forest. Order. Order. Uh, my, uh, my question without notice is to the Minister for Small Business Construction and Customs. I refer the Minister to the budget announcement that the government's hidden tax agenda could include the extension of the Order. prescribed payment scheme to rope in other industries. Can the Minister rule out the extension of the PPS to the taxi industry and other small businesses? Will the extension of the PPS mean that taxi drivers will have 20 per cent of their gross returns deducted by cab companies? What will the effect on small business be of the PPS? Order. Order. The Honourable Member for Fisher, the Honourable Member for Brisbane. And why won't the government come clean on its secret tax agenda? Yeah. The, Mr. Speaker. Honourable, the Honourable Treasurer. The Honourable Treasurer. Order. 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 I'll ask the Treasurer to resume his seat till Mr. I can. Speaker. Uh, I'll, the, uh, order. I'll ask the Treasurer responsibility resume. for taxation rests with me, and uh, I will I will respond to questions asked about taxation to whomever they are directed, except of course the Prime Minister. Now the the, uh, the first point. Don't you worry. The, um, the first point, of course, is that it's uh, an absolute outrage for the honourable member for Forrest to, su to suggest that there is anything, is that there is anything like, anything like, a secret tax agenda being pursued by the government. We have, uh, we have, we have indicated uh, in the budget, in the budget papers, not hidden, not hidden, indeed mentioned in the budget speech, the member mentioned in the budget speech itself. There were some measures which uh, we were prepared to look at, and in our good time we will let you know which of those measures we intend to retain on the table. But, uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, the uh, honourable member refers to the prescribed payment scheme. The, uh, the pr uh, pr prescribed payment scheme, of course, was an invention of the, Howard, the last Howard budget. And, of course, uh, and of course, if you, if, and no doubt uh, advised on this matter by the uh, leader of the opposition. Order. Now, let me give you Mr. Howard's definition uh, of no, this. No, the, the treasurer should refer to him by his appropriate uh, title. Sorry, the, the member for Benelong, the then, the then treasurer's uh, definition. He said, under the, uh, under the heading "Implications of the New Scheme," and this was a discussion paper that was uh, issued uh, in his name on the 17th of August, 1982. The measures outlined in this paper are concerned solely with the reporting of income and collection of income tax correctly payable by persons who receive payments to which the system will apply. In fact, Mr Howard, I mean the, the Honourable uh, Member for Benelong, was at pains to make clear and has been at pains to make clear ever since that this is not a tax as such, it is an alternative uh, method of uh, collecting a tax which is otherwise duly payable. And, uh, of course, uh, the honourable uh, member should, should realise that the mem member for Benelong also said the opposition has never resiled from the position that sensible legislation in this area of the type we originally foreshadowed was absolutely necessary. So, in other words, the honourable member for Benelong has never, ever resiled from the question of the PPS, the PPS being an appropriate uh, mechanism, for the appropriate mechanism for collecting tax which would otherwise be payable. So don't you come here saying, saying, don't you come here saying that this is a new tax? The member because for to do so, you will Bruce. only be contradicting your own member, the former treasurer, who announced this particular measure back in 1982-83. The honourable member for O'Connor has a point of order. The treasurer has concluded. The, but I was the, going to raise the matter concluded. of relevance. No, there's no no point of order. No point of order. Further questions, the honourable member for for 
Adelaide. Good question to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister aware of alternative tariff policies being promoted as a method for increasing job opportunities in Australia and increasing the likelihood of investment in Australian industries? Can the Prime Minister say whether the government agrees with these alternative policies and explain what impact they would have on the car industry in South Australia and the sugar industry in Queensland? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the government has, in the interests of a more competitive trading economy and fairer prices for Australians, sought to induce into Australian industry a more competitive structure by a planned phase reduction in tariff to certain endpoints, uh, which, uh, which uh, the government believes and believed at the time of announcement to be appropriate for particular industries. And, uh, those phase downs began in 1988 and have continued to this point and will finish in 1997 at uh, 25 per cent nominal rate for uh, textiles and apparel and other TCF uh, products, at 15 per cent for motor vehicles and 5 per cent for general manufacturing. But for uh, the leader of the well, after Party. your performance the other night, I'd shut up. Well, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, um, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, order, order. Mr. Speaker, of course, need I say the that, that is that the nominal tariff rate, the endpoint nominal tariff for cars of 15% in 1997 is an effective rate of 36%. That's an effective rate of 36 per cent. That currently effective rate is 113 per cent. It was 243 per cent. But of course the opposition is proposing to take what was an effective rate of 243 per cent in 1988 to zero. And so that the effective rate of 36, which would obtain, which would obtain from a nominal rate of 15 per cent, would of course be abolished. Now, Mr. Speaker, I noticed, uh, I noticed that um, in the Adelaide Advertiser today, the uh, shadow spokesman on, uh, on industry, the member for Barker, said, and I quote, later Mr. McLaughlin said it was, n it was not in dispute that the new investment by, this is by Mitsubishi would be highly unlikely under the coalition's policy. In other words, in other words he's not disputing it would be highly unlikely. Uh, and uh, and uh, he, uh, he did. He did. He did. And on radio, and on radio this morning, on on radio this morning, he said um, uh, a question by Prue Goward. So you accept that under a five percent tariff? He's correct in saying that their investment is highly unlikely. Yes, that's what he told me. He said, uh, so here is an here is an industry, one of the key motor vehicle industries of South Australia, an investment of six hundred million. 600 million, a major investment in world terms, to go into this city, Adelaide, and this state, South Australia. He says that he accepts that the investment is highly unlikely. And when asked by Susan Mitchell, "What if you're wrong?" she says on, in South Australian radio, "What if you're wrong?" Okay, if we're wrong, it'll be a tragedy. <laughs> Too right, it'll be a tragedy. Too right, it'll be a tragedy if you're wrong. And you know you're wrong because, because. Mr Speaker, how would they expect an industry to come from 243 per cent effective rate of protection to nothing, to nothing and, and, uh, and have it survive and then try and induce a $600 million investment by one of the world's major companies, Mitsubishi Motor Corporation of Japan, to have the Australian company seek from, from the parent company $600 million of investment? I mean, this policy would simply put asunder the future of the South Australian motor industry. And what's more, what's more the member for Barkers uh, admitted that uh, it was highly unlikely that the investment would go ahead, and if it didn't, that it would be a tragedy. But still, he presses on with his uh, determination to go to, uh, to zero levels of protection. And, uh, uh, and, we, and we had. Uh, and we had uh, the member for Higgins. The, one for of the backbench members of, of the opposition, the member for Deakin, this morning, saying that um, that Australia's Rambo-like obsession with reducing industry assistance is clearly increasingly dangerous and exposed minority position in the world. 
Above all, above all, he said, under a coalition government, industry will require certainty and common sense in policy formulation and implementation. Exactly what he's not getting. Exactly what he's not getting from the leader of the opposition or his spokesperson on uh, on industry matters. And then, of course, if that's not if that's not bad enough on on cars on sugar, we have. Uh, a, no, a nice little uh, press statement from the deputy leader of the National Party, uh, Mr Lloyd, saying the coalition's new anti-dumping laws would be more powerful in keeping more powerful in keeping dumped sugar out of Australia than tariffs could ever be. In other words, that, that, that is correct, he said. Well, let, him, let me tell you this. Imports of sugar are well under 2 per cent of our market. So how could procedures, whatever procedures on dumping, for imports under 2 per cent have any kind of impact similar to the impact on— No, you're not entitled to argue. You're uh, not entitled to argue the point. Point, point of order, it the member for Murray. No. No. We are no. talking about— No, no, no. 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 Resume your seat. That's a debate. Resume your seat. Unfair trade. I, I warn the, mem I warn the member for Murray. Mr Speaker, this person uh, the, the member for Murray should not transgress the procedures of the House. If he, if he acts that way again, I will name him. No, no, you will not get indulgence. Mr. Speaker, no. you Mr. resume your seat. Mr. The Honourable Speaker, the Prime Minister. That's a transparent diversion. Uh, point of order. Point of order. The Honourable Member for Economy, oh, Prime Minister, resume. I'm pleased seat. the Prime Minister sat down. The point I wish to make to you, sir, Member was when the member got the to his feet. The Prime Minister has an obligation to resume his seat. He failed to do that and carried on with the slanging match, which destroys the propriety of this place. The, uh, the member for Murray had the first requirement to attract the attention of the chair, and he had not done that. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, the, 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 the joke that a, an abolition of the $55 a tonne tariff uh, in lieu of some enhanced procedure on dumping when sugar imports are less than 2 per cent of the uh, of uh, the Point Australian of order, the market. Prime Minister resumes. Said the Honourable Member for Murray. My press statement makes no reference no. whatsoever to no. the abolition of a tariff. I, it's absolute rubbish. I suggest to the Member for Murray that he's trying the patience of the Chair. That is not a matter for debate. There are other forums in which to do that. This question time is not the appropriate time. He should not try the chair again. Mr. 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 Speaker, Prime and, and, and to make matters worse, Mr. Speaker, in the press statement he also said this. He said this that Labor's current policy does not even allow an application to be made against subsidised sugar coming to Australia until our producers have lost at least 20 per cent of the Australian market. That is absolutely wrong. Totally wrong. Not even technically correct. Not even technically correct. So, Mr. Speaker, here's the National Party tied to Dr. Hewson's manic policy of zero tariffs on sugar, which brought all of the things. You know this, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We've not heard one word about NAFTA in two sitting periods, yesterday and today. No word about trade, which was all the issue last week in the smokescreen to avoid scrutiny on sugar and motor cars. And what we find is this sham press statement by the deputy leader of the National Party, a sham press statement by the deputy leader of the National Party, arguing that some dumping procedure for to protect a market where less than 2 per cent of sugar is being imported would be more important than abolishing the $55 a tonne tariff on sugar. The fact is the National Party of Australia are hell-bent on destroying the sugar industry of this country. That's the truth. The North Queensland sugar industry, and they are being supported in the same manic determination to get it down by the Leader of the Opposition, just as he's being supported, uh, and they are su he's supporting the uh, shadow spokesperson on industry in relation to cars. There's no attempt to rationalise these industries' uh, problems, to talk to them. All they get is the same reply, the same reply, Mr. Speaker, abuse from the Leader of the Opposition to be branded as liars, as Mr Johnson from Toyota was the other day, and to be dismissed as being people who are always coming to the government for handouts but who don't have legitimate complaints. The fact is, Mr Speaker, the National Party has hoisted on the petard of zero tariffs and it's not going to get off it. The Honourable Member for Bradfield. Mr Acting Speaker, I direct my question Member without notice Fisher. to the Minister for the Aged, Family and Health Services. And in view of the Treasurer's response to a recent question, can the Minister rule out the extension of the PPS to pharmacists and other providers of medical services? 
Would the extension of the PPS the mean that pharmacists will have 20 per cent of their gross returns deducted by the Health Insurance Commission? And will the extension of the PPS mean that physiotherapists will have 20 per cent of their gross returns deducted by the accident compensation authorities? And perhaps he could also tell the House what will be the overall effect of the PPS on health services in Australia and why won't the government come clean on its secret tax agenda? The Honourable the Treasurer. Well, you might as well save a lot of time and direct them all to me, because I ain't going to answer them. And, uh, Men for Higgins. And uh, I just uh, want Men to. For Gilmore. I just want to re reassert what I said before, and that is that uh, the, prescri the prescribed payments uh, system was introduced, was foreshadowed in the 82-83 budget. It was actually implemented by this uh, government and includes uh, a number of industries. And I just noticed that the uh, honourable, the author of this scheme from the beginning, always said that it was not a tax. It was simply a method of collecting tax which was otherwise payable. And uh, whether or not, whether or not we decide to uh, extend it will be something which will be made perfectly clear in due course. But uh, why? But uh, while we're on the question, while we're on the question of secret taxes, I've noticed uh, a publication in the name of uh, Senator Campbell being distributed to the uh, good electors of uh, Canning, uh, in which, uh, in which uh, he, he purports to give an outline of what the Liberal Party's approach to taxation is. And of course, he talks about fight back, and he says there are seven taxes which are going to be abolished, and he goes through them including one which is already gone, the coal export duty, and including, and, uh, and including one which they now say they're not quite sure whether they want to abolish or not, and that's customs duties. They're not quite sure whether it's zero or negligible, but, uh, oh, it's what? Zero. Captain Zero says it's zero. Is that right? Zero? Zero for uh, everything? Order. Zero the, uh, for everything? The, the Treasurer resume his seat. Uh, point Mr. Of order Speaker, the, the, the standing orders of this place require that m members refer to other members by their appropriate title, and we don't need that uh, unless the, uh, we are all able to use. Made his point. The, the member for O'Connor is correct. The Treasurer should refer to the uh, Leader of the Opposition by his appropriate title, who should also assist the House by not interjecting over the table. The Honourable the Treasurer. The, uh, uh, I'd ask the Treasurer to withdraw the comment. I withdraw the comment. The Honourable Treasurer. And, uh, and of course, one of the others is the training guarantee levy, which isn't a tax anyway, and is paid and is and is paid Order. by the member for Higgins. And, the member for and Higgins. And is is paid. Is, I warn the member for Higgins. Is paid by 1,400, 1,400 taxpayers, and the total amount collected is about three million dollars. So this is one of the great things that they're going to abolish. But, Mr. Speaker, where in this document? Does it tell us there's going to be a GST? Nowhere. Um, Nowhere. Point of order. Speaker, the, the point the point of order. Party. Order. 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 Just order. order. The members of the government will restrain Respect themselves. The, the leader of the National Party. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker. I take a point of order understanding order 145. Whilst the minister may be in order in digressing and adding to his answer on a completely separate subject, the matter of Senator Campbell's pamphlet. He is not allowed to go on at length. It is not relevant to the original question, and I ask that you bring him back to the original question or ask him to resume his seat. I am sure the Honourable the Treasurer is uh, concluding his remarks on the matter of tax. The Honourable Mr. The Treasurer. Mr Speaker, the, the, the question proceeded on Member the basis of, of secret Territory. taxes, and of course Senator Campbell would like to keep secret for very obvious reasons. Senator Campbell would like to keep secret the fact that they intend to impose a GST on everything. Including, of course, including, of course, many. The leader of the National in, Party. Including, of course, many of the many of the items, many of the items which are sold by pharmacists. And so, uh, of course, uh, if uh, if there is a question to be answered here, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is not by us. It's a question which has to be asked by answered by the opposition and a question which I'm sure pharmacists throughout Australia would be fascinated to have the answers to. Because if we look at the question of, uh, of exemptions under the current wholesale sales tax, we find— The point of order, leave the National Understanding Party. Order 145, clearly the minister has now even moved on further, totally away from the original question, and you should ask order. him to resume his seat. The, uh, 
the question related to tax, and the Treasurer is answering the question. The Honourable the Treasurer. And these, uh, these, items, these items are exempt under the wholesale sales tax. Point of order, the oh, member for Mitchell. I'm telling you your secrets. No, no. The member for no Mitchell. Problems with the truth. Um, <laughs> member for Mitchell has a point of order. Yes, under 145, Mr Deputy Speaker, the question was not on tax, it was on prescribed payment taxes. Oh. Nothing else. It was that narrow. The Treasurer is in order. The Honourable the Treasurer. Yes, the Leader of the House. That was not a point of order to anything the Treasurer said. It was a direct attack on your ruling. And that is disorderly. The Honourable the Treasurer. So in the Member for O'Connor. Point of order. The uh, Leader of the House has just wasted this Parliament's time. The question um, asked on behalf of. Let me repeat the question. The question asked on behalf of the pharmacy profession of Australia, are you going to impose order. prescribed the, the payment taxes on their income? The member for O'Connor is no point of order. The Honourable Treasurer. So amongst the, amongst the things that the farmers sell are bath seats for disabled or elderly persons, cotton wool, bandages, first aid kits, toothbrushes, contraceptives, sunscreen preparations, sanitary pads, babies' nappies, and so on and so forth. These are all exempt under the wholesale sales tax. But are they exempt under the GST? No, no, no. And so why doesn't, why doesn't Senator Campbell, why doesn't Senator Campbell come clean and say not only does he intend to have a GST on everything, but he ought to tell the honourable member for Bradfield that it'll apply to half the things or more that the pharmacists actually sell so that the pharmacists actually become a tax agent for any Liberal government. The honourable member for Richmond. My question is to the Minister for Trade and Overseas Development. Can the minister inform the House how the government's trade policies have contributed to the dramatic increase in Australian exports over the past nine years? The Honourable Minister for Trade and Overseas Development. What an intelligent Member question, Gilmore. Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, Australians have a lot of difficulty believing they can be successful. Except for on the sporting field, where we believe success is essential, Australians tend to doubt success stories. The opposition doesn't believe we can actually be successful in Australia. The opposition leader traipses around. You're the biggest joke I've seen in this place for a long time. The opposition leader, Mr. Speaker, traipses around the country, telling Australians we're lazy and that renters don't even mow their lawns. He abuses people in interest groups that disagree with him. You know, no one should live in a world beyond the fence of St. John of Friedman and his economic textbooks. Meanwhile, meanwhile, this government has been working hard to turn this economy around by encouraging us, encouraging Australia in what we do best. And the success is real, Mr. Speaker. Our export volumes have doubled since March 1993, when the Labor government first took office. Growth in manufacturing the exports in 1990 and 1991 has been the fastest in the OECD. In 1990, our export volumes grew twice as fast as the rate of growth of world trade. In 1991, our growth was four times the growth rate of world trade. So, on the export front, we are growing faster than the world. We are moving ahead of the world. We are catching up with our competitors. The sleepy decades of coalition government are behind us. The export-led recovery is real, and the cultural change in Australia that will lead us to even greater export growth is also real. Now, Mr. Speaker, this is a success story that all Australians own and can be proud of which is why it's absurd that the opposition have decided to deny this success and promulgate the kind of rubbish they have been putting around ever since the Leader of the Opposition went to Queensland. Now, all this was done without any real policy basis. It was done purely to divert Queensland attention away from the opposition's two most embarrassing problems—their suicidal zero tariffs policy and the National Party. And all they've succeeded in doing was embarrassing themselves even more both here and overseas. And they've done nothing about the coalition split that is slowly widening in North Queensland sugar country and will spread through the coalition like the San Andreas Fault. And even here, and even Gilmore. this morning, Bob Catter, Bob Catter, that great man of the National Party, said this on the country Leave area. The 
country hour. All it used to be a minister there, uh, leader of the opposition. All the members of parliament north of Brisbane, every single one of them, and as far as I know, every single candidate north of Brisbane has come out trenchantly opposed to any further reduction in the sugar tariffs. Certainly, it's the National Party in Queensland. They are trenchantly opposed to any further reduction in the sugar tariffs. How's that, Mr. Zero? Now, of course, um, what was the, happening the, in Queensland? The, the, the Honourable the Minister should was there. refer the leader the by his appropriate title and ask him to withdraw. I withdraw. The Honourable Minister. I withdraw, Mr. Wigan. And of course, it all comes from Queensland. All this nonsense on trade we've been hearing the last week. The opposition leader was desperate to divert attention away from this split, away from the sugar tariffs. Now, he probably felt the earth move moving as he spoke. So he attacked Japan. He knew. The uh, Honourable Member O'Connor has a point of order. Yes, uh, the Honourable Minister will resume his seat. When we consult Pettifer, one of the responsibilities of ministers is to answer questions according to their own responsibility and also briefly and succinctly. The ministers come in here with a handwritten answer for a Dorothy Dixer. He is so far away from the relevance of the original request, but it's, it's an insult to this parliament that the sort of drivel that he's talking. There's, there's no point of order. The Honourable Minister, I'm, I'm sure the Honourable Minister is uh, close to concluding his answer. Mr Speaker, if the opposition doesn't think that the question of the sugar industry, which is one of our great export industries, is not relevant to my answer, it shows how completely out of touch they are. The reason why the, reason why the Leader of the Opposition engaged in all this nonsense on trade last week was because of the embarrassment of the Opposition about their zero tariff policy and the way that it would affect the export sugar industry. And they had a little bit going, and they couldn't believe their luck. Out comes President Bush's EEP announcement. So they almost thought they had a trade policy. Uh, they couldn't believe their luck. They thought they had a policy within their grasp. And that is, you know, attack everybody, retaliate, talk tough, don't take no for an answer. Totally negative, of course, but better than nothing. And the problem was there are no real ingredients in the souffle. Nothing there, just hot air and wind. Retaliate, said the leader of the National Party on Late Line. He said he wanted, and I'll quote, a degree of sensible retaliation without hurting yourself, which I concede is not going to be an easy path. Asked um, how he would point retaliate, of order, he the said. O'Connor, the minister will resume his seat. The member O'Connor is uh, the taking a succession relevance. of points of order. Yes. I remind but, him the well, I'm certainly being encouraged patience. by the activities of the ministers of the government, sir, in their answering of questions. Get to your point of order. Yes, I would. And my question is the matter of relevance. The minister himself just said that he was trying to say something about sugar, and his reference to a souffle was about as close as he's got for the last five There's minutes. No he's now order. talking about There's no wheat. Point of order. No point of order. The Leader of the House. You better Mr. Be Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this is about the third time in the course of this answer that the, uh, the member has come up with an irrelevant point of order on relevance and debated the subject during the course of it. A point of order is a highly specific technical discussion, not a debate. And uh, that's the third debating point that the Honourable Member for O'Connor has come up. That's the, the third the, disorder leave the House should resume the seat. The, the opposition should not uh, misuse the system of points of order to disrupt the procedures of the House. The Honourable the Minister. The, the Minister will assist the House if he uh, concludes his answer. Yes, well, on the point of order, Mr. Speaker, I thought there was quite a bit of sugar in souffle. Maybe the member from Kuyong can help me. Minister will. But ask how he would retaliate. The leader of the National Party said, well, well, then you cross that bridge when you come to it. Now, this is the alternative Deputy Prime Minister proposing a tough trade policy. He'll cross that bridge when he comes to it. Now, the real shadow trade minister is not stupid. He, he's the one who told us on television last Sunday that he's going to have a sophisticated trade policy. Since then, he's been quoted in the media saying that he rules out retaliation against the United States. That is sophisticated. It's about time he took his country cousins aside and showed them some of his smooth ways. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, the opposition has no trade policy, so they have to result. They have to resort to bluster and bully, and this is where the, uh, the shadow minister comes into his own. So I invite the shadow minister to cross Tim's Bridge now, before we come to it, because we need a sophisticated approach to trade policy. The, I'm sure the minister has concluded his answer. Well, Mr. Speaker, I want to make 
one more point. No. No. I, I'm, I'm sure the Minister has concluded his answer. Further questions? Further questions? The Honourable Member for Murray. Mr Acting Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Primary Industries and Energy. Order. I refer Order. the Member Minister. For Page. I refer the Minister to the budget announcement that the government's hidden tax agenda could include the extension of the prescribed payment system Order. to rope in other Member industries. For Can the Minister rule out the extension of the PPS system to farmers and fishermen? Will the extension of PPS mean that fishermen have 20 per cent of their gross returns deducted? And you've basically said that in the budget. Well, wheat growers, dairy farmers, wool growers and every other form of farmers also have 20 per cent of their returns deducted, and that's been stated the, in the uh, budget. The member for Murray why should won't not the debate government come the clean on its secret tax agenda? The Honourable the Treasurer. Mr. Mr. Speaker, this Treasurer. is a pathetic display on the part of the... No, there's Minister no point of order. Resume your seat. Energy, not of Resume your seat. I warn the member for Murray, and I'll name him next time he, he transgresses. The honourable the treasurer. And quickly. This is this is a pathetic display on the part of the uh, on the part of the opposition. First of all, first of all, they raise they raise they the raise the prospect of uh, PPS on taxi drivers. I wonder if these are the same taxi drivers on whom you are going to impose a GST on 15%. Of every fare that they charge, is this, are these the same taxi drivers? Are these the same taxi drivers? And of the course, uh, in relation to in relation, in relation to uh, in relation to uh, farmers, in relation to farmers, farmers, are you suggesting? Is the honourable deputy leader of the uh, of the National Party suggesting that farmers are tax dodgers? Are you suggesting? I haven't mentioned farmers. I haven't mentioned farmers. I haven't mentioned farmers. What I have done, what I have done, is quote from what your colleague sitting next to you said. What I what I quoted from. Just let me repeat it. The just, member, just member let me just just let me repeat what the chap sitting next to you said. The measures outlined in this paper, that is his measure, PBS, are concerned solely with the reporting of income and collection of income tax correctly payable by persons who receive payments to which the system will apply. So is the Honourable Deputy Leader of the uh, country, National Party saying that all the people that he uh, alluded to are the people they have identified to whom the PPS might be appropriate because they're not paying tax? You're the ones Leader who have the identified Party. them. We have identified no one. And uh, we, have not even said, we have not even said we're going to do it. We have said we'll tell you in due course, sooner rather, sooner, sooner rather than later. But, um, but, uh, but, uh, Mr. 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 Deputy Speaker, uh, the other the other issue which the uh, government raised, of course, was the uh, was the possibility of interest withholding tax. And of course, we had the shadow treasurer running around saying, "Oh, this was a secret tax which was going to be imposed the on all Mayo kinds should of people his seat. in respect of their interest." The member so, for uh, Mayo will resume his seat. I warn the member for Mayo. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thought I might just uh, remind the opposition of a press release put out by the leader of the opposition in April of 1990. When he said in part, when he said in part, finally, Mr. Reith is to examine a number of aspects of taxation policy. He is to investigate a number of proposals to Member simplify the tax Member system, in particular the collection of tax with a view to providing for many Australians not having to file an annual tax return. These proposals include the withholding tax system on interest income rather than Present, the present system of declaration. So that was in April 90. We have heard nothing since about this particular measure. Nothing since about this particular measure. And so what the what the opposition has got to say is what are their plans in response to Mr. Reith's investigation of the interest withholding system and what are they proposing to do about it? The Honourable Member for Carayo. Mr Speaker, my question without notice is to the Treasurer. I will remind the Treasurer that recently the Ford Motor Company and Back Backwell IXL in my electorate have announced substantial export orders, particularly in respect to the automo automotive industry. 
I asked the Treasurer, is he able to inform the House, particularly in view of recent attacks on the industry, um, of the performance of the automobile industry in particular in advancing Australian exports? The Honourable the Treasurer. Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, I uh, thank the Honourable Member for uh, Correo for his question and uh, acknowledge his uh, diligence in uh, promoting the interests of uh, manufacturing industry in the uh, Geelong area. And of course, uh, Geelong is a well-known centre for, man uh, for uh, the motor vehicle industry, and he rightly, he rightly relates to the success on the export side of that particular industry and in the case of Geelong Ford, where as part of the very successful enterprise that Ford's been involved in in exporting Capri's, the, uh, the components the components uh, of those uh, panels, <laughs> the components uh, in relation Believe to panels, officer. are in fact made in Geelong. And uh, of course, he uh, would also refer to the fact that Ford have recently been successful in gaining their first export order to Japan, approximately $30 million worth of engine blocks, creating about 50 new jobs. And he also refers to Blackwell IXL, who are now going to invest something a little under a million dollars to employ more people in order to uh, f fulfil another export contract which they have uh, been able to achieve. And of course, uh, this is the industry, Mr. Speaker, which uh, is now has, uh, has uh, been singled out for special attention by the opposition to the point where the industry is unclear about where its future lies. But of course, uh, it is, um, it is uh, important to realise that there are people who know about this industry, not just those who are vilified by the Leader of the Opposition, those people who he says are part of a wicked conspiracy with the government to undermine opposition policy. There are others who have, who have actually investigated this industry and have some knowledge of it. And I refer particularly to uh, Bill Scales when he was then the chief executive of the Automotive Industry Authority, not in the lap of, uh, not in the, lap of the industry, but rather independent and responsible for the implementation of the Button Car Plan. And what did he say when confronted in an interview in which he did like a dinner, the honourable member for Barker? He said the opposition's zero tariff policy would result in the loss of 40 to 45,000 jobs now involved in automotive manufacture in Australia. This, unless, uh, unless Mr Scales is going to join the hate list, the, hate, the Houston hate list, uh, he, he could not be said to have had any vested interest in making a comment uh, such as that. What he was concerned about was the future of this industry and how it developed. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the opposition leader has been uh, making all kinds of crazy accusations about the government and the chief executives of motor companies. Well, I want to confess, I did have a discussion with the head of uh, Robert Bosch, Mr uh, Hugendubel, who at a dinner in Melbourne with a no number of other business people. And what he said to me on that occasion was that they had decided to put on ice an, a, an investment plan of involving 40 to 50 million dollars uh, in the electorate of Hotham uh, because they were unclear about whether there would be a car industry here whether there would be a car industry here at the end of this decade I name because the member for Murray the member for Murray be suspended from the service of the house the question is the motion be agreed to those of that opinion please say aye the contrary no i think ayes have it noes have it division required ring the bells Yes, the Leader of the National Party. I know whether you might entertain with indulgence an apology from the uh, Deputy Leader so this matter might be dealt with in a proper way. Well, the member for Murray had previously been warned and was defying the Chair, and he proceeded to do so again. Um, and uh, the Leader of the House has moved a motion. Uh, the member for Murray interjected yet again. Mr Acting Speaker, it is not my intention to go against your wishes. 
I made a comment here, and, and I'm, I'm sure, surely I'm allowed to make some comment, but it, it, was, it was not an interjection in that sense. I, I had no desire to interfere uh, with your, the exercise of your responsibility. The chair considered and I apologise if I did. In, in, in which case, if, if the member for Murray wishes to take that course of action, uh, the chair uh, would not wish to proceed. But I am now depend upon the leader of the house. I withdraw the motion. The, I thank the member for Murray. The, the matter is dealt you. with. The honourable the treasurer. Some of us have had more experience with these things than others. Uh, but uh, what, uh, what, um, what, uh, what the chief executive uh, of Bosch said, of course, was that they are producing to the local market here and want to continue to do so, and indeed wish to invest uh, 40 or 50 million dollars in order to continue their operation. And I said to, I said to the chief executive, "What do you need? What assurances do you need?" to ensure that you go ahead with that investment. He said, I need only one assurance, and that is that there will be a continuity of the current car plan in Australia. That is all he needs, a continuity of the current car plan in Australia, which would uh, provide the basis for that investment to proceed in 94 or 95 in order to extend uh, their operation uh, in this country. So, Mr. S Mr Deputy Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is uh, always keen to set hurdles for other people. Indeed, only the other night he thought he would set some targets for the Prime Minister in terms of his forthcoming visit for Japan. I set a target for the, uh, for the Leader of the Opposition. Why doesn't he remove the one obstacle which would prevent Robert Bosch Australia, a leading German company, to invest 40 or 50 million dollars in Victoria in a manufacturing industry in order to extend its operation here. He can remove that barrier by simply making one statement, and that is the car plan as it exists will remain. That's all he has to do. That's all he has to do in order to ensure that investment proceeds and the employment that go, goes with it extends. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, thanks, Mr Acting Speaker. I'm happy to take up the challenge. We get rid of the Prime Minister and the Government the, uh, and we'll solve the, the problem. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition should ask his question. Question without notice is to the Prime Minister, and it relates to jobs, the issue that was just addressed in the Treasurer's last answer. The Prime Minister would be aware that the latest ABS figures <coughs> show that employment in the private sector has plummeted to 1987 levels. Plummeted to 1987 levels. Is it a fact that nearly 180,000 private sector jobs, just to set his comments in context, were wiped out in the last year? How many more Australians are in work today because of your One Nation promises? How many more Australians are in work today because of your budget promises? And when will the government admit that it really has no plan to create one million jobs for the, for the unemployed in Australia? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Yeah, that's 180,000 off the 1.8 million since 1983. Yeah. 180,000 180, too many. 180,000 too many, but off the 1.8 million since 1983. In 1983, Mr. Mr. Speaker. The labour market was around 6 million in number. By, by late 1989, early 90, it was 7.8 million. It has since declined, and it's a, and it's a great pity that it has. But, but we had five times as much employment growth in those nine years as we had in the seven years of the previous government. That is, that is there is almost a million of those jobs wouldn't have been there had the economic performance of the then, opposite, then government continued. In other words, if we'd have kept the same rate of employment growth, the same rate of employment growth as the, lead, as, as the member for Bennelong was able to generate, advised by the member for Wentworth, the leader of the opposition, there would be about a million Australians fewer employed today than there currently is. We have participation rates in this country of over around 63 per cent. In countries like the United States, it's 56 and 57. And if we were comparing their participation rates with our unemployment rate, we'd have it well in the low single digit, in the middle single digit numbers. Or indeed, Mr. Speaker, if we we're even comparing the participation rate of 1982 with today, we'd have unemployment well under 10 per cent. Well under 10 per cent. It's a matter of great pride to us that Australians are encouraged to look for work, that the participation rate is high because people want to find jobs. 
because, particularly for women who found so many jobs throughout the 1980s with these policies. That, is, that was policies which put a focus upon employment growth uh, and, uh, and economic growth in particular, and where we were not run by some sort of anti-inflation objective solely, but where we had declining and decelerating inflation as well as uh, accelerating employment. But does the Leader of the Opposition really think that a 15 per cent addition to tax is going to help employment? Does he really think that, uh, that nearly $30 billion, Mr Speaker, the, the total income tax raises $49 billion in prospect for this year? The GST raises 27. It's over half the income tax. Over half the income tax. And yet, does the Leader of the Opposition believe that such a huge tax impost across the economy, this must be the only people in the world that the believe that you can actually improve employment, Goldstein. that you can actually make employment better by whacking a 15 per cent tax on value adding? 15 per cent. If you believe that employment is important, why do you want to put 15 per cent on the employment content of Australian product? Why do you want to put 15 per cent on the value added in Australian product? Why do you believe, how by any warped, twisted sense of logic do you believe, that against a record of three times the, the OECD average employment growth, of five times yourself, that you could put a 15 per cent tax on all products in the economy, and that by some black magic is going to produce more employment. You've got to be joking. You've got to be joking. You regard the unemployed as a buffer at the end of the station. They can take the impact of your crazy economic policies. They can take the impact of your so-called adjustment, the for just like they did in Britain, just like they have uh, throughout other parts of the developed world, but which they didn't do in Australia under Labor. And the fact is, Mr Speaker, that the economic stimulus we now have in the place with uh, the One Nation package, with the youth package, with the budget is about twice the 83-4 stimulus, but still it's about half the stimulus which has been put there by Japan. It's a responsible level of uh, support for activity in the economy, and it will produce a growth in output and a growth in employment, something which the current opposition has no interest in whatsoever, because they believe that the remedy, foolishly, is to put a 15 per cent tax on all goods and services in the economy. Mr Speaker, this can only be a recipe for higher unemployment and, of course, with it, six to seven percentage points addition to inflation, six to six to seven percentage points addition to, to interest rates and, with it, a slower low-growth economy. The Honourable Member for Brisbane. Thank you, Mr uh, Acting Speaker. Uh, my question is addressed to the Prime Minister. I ask the Prime Minister, can he tell the House whether the government is satisfied with the current charter of the Reserve Bank and whether he believes a so-called independent Reserve Bank is consistent with parliamentary democracy? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker I have said there has been a debate in this country about the role of the Reserve Bank, about its supposed independence or otherwise. And I have said on a number the of occasions that um, uh, point of order, the member for O'Connor, the Prime Minister, yes, resume uh, seat. Standing Order 144, on second part on page 43, lists questions should not ask ministers. A for an expression of opinion. The Prime Minister has just been asked to ex express his opinion on, on how the, the Reserve Bank should operate in a democracy. No, there's no point of order. The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. I've said in the parliament on a number of occasions that government and, uh, and parliament should be the supreme and accountable bodies to the public of Australia, and that the right balance exists between the legislation, the, reserve, the powers of the Reserve Bank under its legislation, and the prerogatives the of the government. That is an appropriate, an appropriate balance between the prerogatives of the government and the rights and entitlements of the Reserve Bank Board. I've said that the existing arrangements work well that the Reserve Bank Act is crafted well to encourage the board and the government to agree, and that price stability and full employment are the dual objectives. They were well constructed when the Act was written, and they remain well constructed. Now, we have had against that view a view put by the opposition that the Reserve Bank is not independent, that is polit politically manipulated, uh, as the Leader of the Opposition has said. And in his fight-back document, he says, uh, on page 38, we will also legislate to give the Reserve Bank effective independence. 
and a clear mandate to achieve medium-term price stability. No mention of full employment, no mention of employment, medium-term price stability with a clear legislative mandate for effective independence. But he said that all changes to monetary policy will be decided by the, by the bank board, not by the government and the bank board, by the bank board. And he, he's gone on to say, you know, that's, that's in the official document, in remarks, I'm attacking the issue of the Reserve Bank, etc. Now, Mr. Speaker, in a very interesting article, which I've discovered in the economic papers of the Economic Society of Australia and New Zealand, published in February 1980, there's a long piece, 18 pages by the Leader of the Opposition, about the Reserve Bank, its independence and its charter. And I think it, ought, it's, it makes very interesting reading, Mr. Speaker, because if ever the charge erratic could ever stick, it will stick here. The of the opposition. It says here, listen to this, this is unbelievable. In simple terms, it needs to be decided whether such an institution would be undemocratic. That's an independent central bank. It is realistic, is it realistic or tolerable to contemplate the establishment of an independent central bank in a parliamentary democracy as exists in Australia? However, I would suggest that a fully independent central bank would be inconsistent with our system of parliamentary democracy. At, at the risk of oversimplification and idealism, the fundamental concepts of our system are those of accountability and responsibility. The parliament is elected and is responsible to the people. The executive government is responsible to the parliament. The essence of this process is that responsibility and authority go together. Against this background, it would seem to be intolerable to establish an organisation to conduct monetary policy whereby such control could be vested in the hands of a few people who would not be subject to supervision by either government, not be subject to, to, to supervision by either government or parliament, and who would need to take no account of the views of the electorate. Furthermore, I doubt whether making such an institution free of political control would necessarily depoliticise that institution. But he goes on to say, to summarise, as the elected government must bear the ultimate responsibility for economic policy formulation and execution, the central bank should, in the limit, be subservient to governments. No talk about independence, no talk about reserve bank charters, no talk about legislation. We cannot seriously contemplate a situation where the bank could set out to negate the economic policies that have been settled on by the government and by the parliament. Now, now, the Mr. now Mr. Speaker, let me, let me go on this proposal as a conclusion. To conclude, I feel it would be difficult to Mr. Mr. Speaker, I feel it would be difficult to improve upon the drafting of the existing sections of the Reserve Bank Act dealing with the bank's relations. I mean, talk about erratic. Talk about immature. As a statement of principle, they are adequate. The key thing is how they work in practice. And at this level, the relationship seems, on the whole, to have worked reasonably well. There are a few examples of the bank having gone off on its own track for extended periods. The bank has generally accepted that the government carried ultimate responsibility for economic policy formulation and execution, and seemed to have generally established a reasonable and helpful working relationship with successive governments. Now, Mr Speaker, no change existed in the constitutional arrangement since then, and if anything has happened since then, by moving to a quantity-based system with the float, the bank has got more institutional independence. More. But still, he could write this in a careful and serious way for a major, a major, a major book on papers, an 18-page printed document, where he has gone through during his own period when he was advisor, write this and then go on with the, the bile against Bernie Fraser while proposing that Mr Tim Marcus Clark might be the governor of the Reserve Bank, <laughs> which he says in uh, uh, Tim Marcus the Clark. Of the that, is, that, is, that is a career bureaucrat who I had never met before I became a minister, who was recommended to me by Mr Stone and supported by Mr Howard for appointment as Secretary of the Treasury, who was properly appointed as Governor of the Reserve Bank, has been berated and attacked and politicised by you, while you propose the likes of Tim Marcus Clark to replace him, a disgrace. And not only that, when you talk about giving the Reserve Bank independence, a right to construct monetary policy absolutely and alone without reference to the government, and where you simply turn over all of the sensible tenets reflecting every view I have put in this place and that the Governor has put in his uh, remarks, every sensible view, 
existing around the existing Reserve Bank Act. And whatever you do, what we've seen, Mr. Speaker, to simply support, to simply make a cheap political point to say the Reserve Bank has been manipulating interest rates, the whole of the fight back policy is constructed basically on a policy he doesn't believe in. A policy which at earlier, at earlier stages, he said, has worked well with an appropriate balance between the, the bank and the Mayo. government, where the, elected, where the elected people of Australia should have authority. This is the erraticism, this is the erratic, immature behaviour of a person who, who has known better, the will now do Mayo, anything, anything to attract attention, anything to be different, anything to be malicious. And it's why Australian business, it's why the Treasury, it's why the, the Reserve Bank and all these people take no notice Members, of him, regard him as an extremist, but most of all regard him as irrelevant. And I ask that further questions be placed on the notice page.